need a bigger boat. Well, this year in movies has certainly been coming to a pretty disappointing end, hasn't it? You hope the year's end brings films that are competing for the best movie of the year. Instead, we have Joker fully a deuce and Gladiator 2 competing for a sequel that the writer most obviously never intended to make when he wrote the original. The movie starts with somewhat of an animated recap of the first film, because it came out 24 years ago, so you need to be reminded of it, and so you can think to yourself throughout the two and a half hour runtime, man, I wish I had just stayed home and rewatched the original one. The story picks up 16 years after Maximus dies in the first one, and follows his son Lucius, whose mother sent him away for his safety. He ends up in Numidia with his new wife before Joel Miller comes to conquer the territory for Rome in one of the dumber battle sequences I've seen in a while. Aside from the trebuchets wrecking the catapults, that was based. It makes you wonder why anyone even bothered wearing any armor, as swords slashed through them like paper. At one point in the midst of this hectic battle, Lucius' wife shoots an arrow at the soldier standing next to Oberyn Martell, and he turns, spots her, and orders his archers to stop what they're doing, turn, and shoot her, which they do. But what's funny is the archers apparently ran down the stairs with the infantry, instead of dealing with the Numidian archers on the wall and holding the higher ground. So Lucius gets taken and ends up in the custody of Denzel Washington. Oh yeah, if you couldn't tell, I'm not avoiding any spoilers because I don't think this movie deserves that respect. So Denzel Washington makes him and some other captives taken from Numidia fight in a little mini coliseum against a pack of zombie monkeys. I can only describe them as if Remus Lupin as a werewolf had sex with a baboon. Now, you might be wondering why the sequel to Gladiator has CGI animals that look less real than the mutts from Catching Fire, and I say just you wait. Denzel takes a liking to Lucius and buys him to gamble his way into a position of leverage over a Roman senator, betting on his guy in Gladiator matches. In exchange, he tells Lucius he will get for him the Mandalorian's head. When Lucius ends up in Rome, we meet the Emperor. Oh, sorry, Emperors. Yeah, Rome ended up with two Emperors, which, well, I'll just let Oscar take it. Go ahead, name a country that doesn't have two presidents. A boat that sets sail without two captains. Where would Catholicism be without the popes? Yes, there was a time in Rome when there were two brothers ruling as dual emperors. They lasted less than a year. Before I get into these twin buffoons, I might as well tell you what their deal is. They want to conquer as much land as possible with no regard for the people they conquer or their own citizens. That's it. How are either of these clowns ruling? They're both power-hungry nutjobs, but they also both find sharing the position of emperor until Denzel Washington convinces one to turn on the other. And there's no way these two jabronis have kept their power. They don't treat anyone well, not their citizens, or in particular the senators and Roman noblemen, but they're also not smart. One is completely mentally unhinged, obviously susceptible to manipulation. At one point, he literally makes a monkey his chief advisor. And the other one is just a slightly more sane dullard. I could overthrow these two. They're not Commodus. They're not evil but intelligent. They're evil and stupid. They have no actualizable plan. They also aren't portrayed by actors with half the talent of Joaquin Phoenix. Once brought to Rome, his mother realizes that the new gladiator in the Colosseum is her son because she heard that he recited the poem her father, Marcus Aurelius, used to recite. Then he picks up the dirt in the arena like Maximus did, I guess. But anyway, Lucius continues to be a gladiator, and we see a pair of arena battles that beg the question if this movie even wants me to take it seriously. The first one has a group of the gladiators fighting against the current champion, and the... I can't, I can't believe I actually had to write this down. The current champion is riding a battle rhino. <laughs> like he's from Wakanda. And to my surprise, apparently the real Commodus would bring rhinos into the arena for target practice. So... Ridley Scott could have had Lucius fight a rhino, but how do you go from your protagonist fuming about vengeance to having some LARPer riding a rhino like it's a pony and expect your audience not to spit out their popcorn laughing? And that's only the second most ridiculous battle in the arena. The next one is a simulated naval battle. Now, how do you simulate a naval battle in a dirt arena? Well, apparently you pump in water to flood the thing. That may seem like a stupid use of aqueducts to you, my pragmatic viewers. But Ridley Scott had to go and make it ten times worse. Apparently, this water is coming from the ocean, which, according to the AI Google answer, is at minimum 15 miles from the Colosseum. So they're pumping salt water through 15 miles of aqueducts. How do I know it's salt water? 
Because in the water, in the arena, are a bunch of great white sharks. <laughs> what? How did you get the sharks there? How did you transport them 15 miles without them dying? By chariot? Where are they keeping them? It's 2024 and we don't keep great whites in aquariums because they can't survive captivity. So did they have fishermen go out at the exact right time to catch and transport them by horse to the Colosseum to have them ready for the battle? Can I see a movie about how ancient Rome managed to pull that off? That sounds way more interesting than this. Back to the plot. We're almost done. Lucilla and Din Djarin, who's married to Lucilla, which technically makes him Lucia's stepfather, stage an unsuccessful coup against the emperors. Which, if you can't overthrow these two Muppets, I really struggle to wrap my head around how you're the best general the Roman army has. Then, Maxwell Lord has to fight Lucius in the arena and ends up getting killed by archers because Lucius decides not to take his revenge. Lucius successfully incites the Roman people to have their own 2020 Summer of Love. Uh, it is not, generally speaking, unruly, but fires have been started. We did it, Patrick! We saved the city! And in the midst of it all, Denzel convinces the more mentally inept brother to kill the slightly less mentally inept brother and become the most powerful person in Rome. My plot summary is getting more jumbled now, and that's on purpose, because I want to give you the feel of watching the movie yourself. Lucius summons Javier Pena's army, which he's able to do by having a former gladiator show the commanding officer a ring that belonged to Maximus. Sure, why wouldn't that be enough information, I guess? So that army faces off against the Roman Praetorian army, and then they don't fight. Like it's freaking Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2. Yes, I've seen the Twilight movies. 16-year-old Sauce was more manipulable by pretty girls. Instead, Lucius fights the 69-year-old Denzel Washington, who thinks that fight is going to end in any other way than with him getting his head chopped off. And then it ends with him getting his head chopped off. What a story. What a ridiculous, unnecessary, laughable story. This movie is not a serious movie. I found myself laughing at it far too many times. I already broke down the plot and world building for the most part in that summary, so I'll just add a few more things. First, Lucius' character development. He's not Maximus. And that wouldn't be a problem if they weren't trying to make him like Maximus. There's a weird dichotomy going on where the movie kind of splits Maximus' character between Lucius and Pedro Pascal. But Pedro Pascal, after being the catalyst for getting Lucius to Rome, really takes a back seat for most of the movie. Lucilla is actually much more important. And Lucius' character development is frustrating to witness. He's motivated by vengeance, but the target of his vengeance constantly changes. His emotions are in flux more than they should be. When his mom first finds him, he's ice cold towards her. He denies that he's her son and tells her her son is probably dead. But the next time he sees her, he embraces her. And not enough happened in the time in between to justify such a radical shift in his attitude. For most of the movie, all he wants is Pedro Pascal's head. Because it was his invasion, his order, that killed Lucius' wife. But when he finally gets the chance to kill him, he refuses. His ire then turns towards the emperors, but they die far away from him. Finally, his quest for vengeance turns to Denzel Washington. But it's at the very end of the movie, and he kills him within about five minutes of him becoming his new target. His motivation shifts from wanting to avenge his wife to pursuing the dream of Rome that his father and grandfather once sought. But it's not clear why that shift occurs. He's just a terribly inconsistent character. This film really tried to recreate the original Gladiator. There are instances where you can clearly see them trying to mirror a scene onto this film. Lucius picking up the sand. Lucius addressing the masses in the Colosseum with a challenging question. They even overlay this film with footage from the first one. And at one point, the gladiators legitimately share an I'm Spartacus moment. Any theme the movie might be trying to explore about power and how it's acquired is lost in its bright lights and admittedly cool ancient Roman settings. It all makes for a movie, though, that is impossible to take seriously. So yes, I am entertained, but for all the wrong reasons. All right, the sauce. <laughs> what? The sauce. I don't know. You're using too much sauce. Okay? Review's over. <laughs>